Computer-generated imagery, or CGI, has allowed for a massive range of new stories to be told through movies and TV. Black holes, dragons, superheroes! Oh my! I used to think CGI was some sort of mysterious nerd magic that could only be made by a powerful supercomputer at a Hollywood studio. However, I began my own visual effects career when I realized this wasn't the case. I realized that this was an actual career path for thousands of artists across the world. I now work for a small production studio called Corridor Digital, and we're known for using visual effects to make fun short films on YouTube. I love bringing things to life that didn't previously exist, and at the heart of that for me are visual effects. I am a big fan. However, not everyone shares my excitement about that, and I get it, it's fine. Sometimes the effects just suck. Sometimes you can just tell that it's fake, and that's a bit of a bummer. You watch movies to enjoy stories, but when the CGI is bad, it can take you out of it. Last year, for instance, I walked out of the theater having just seen Black Panther. Now, I really enjoyed this movie. However, I was disappointed by the quality of CGI, particularly in the final fight scene. And it turned out I wasn't alone either. I asked Twitter what movies they thought had bad effects and they overwhelmingly responded with Black Panther. I am hesitant to just openly criticize the effects of a movie because a lot of overworked artists help create them. And I think about those artists a lot. But you know who doesn't think about them? Basically everyone else. You see, there's a common misconception regarding how CGI is created. People tend to think effects are just made by computers rather than actual people. Like an Instagram filter, they think we just press a button and poof! Movie magic. <laughs> the Hollywood VFX pipeline, however, is really complicated. First, you need proper onset data acquisition to feed to the camera tracking department where a bunch of sculptors will then build detailed 3D models to send off to texture artists to make them look real. And once lighting is set, render farms are managed 24 hours a day to spit out clean looking CGI, only to land on a compositor's desk who performs video Photoshop to blend everything into a final image. <sighs> And if you didn't get all that, it's all right. Just know that every one of these steps can only begin once the previous step has been completed. But if any of those steps break down, those next in line are stuck polishing a turd, as we say in the industry. You'd be surprised how often that happens. And yet, visual effects are so ubiquitous now that they just don't wow us anymore. We've become desensitized. And while not everyone is an artist, everyone is a critic. If anything is slightly off, audiences can tell it looks fake, even if they don't know how. So what tips us off? Well, the first sign is that it simply isn't photo real. The lighting or materials don't represent reality well enough to look like a real photograph. It's a simple idea, but a pretty tall order. And it's a little unfair even, because we all have a lot of experience with reality. We see it every waking moment. Everything that you can see has a material property that defines how it reacts to light, and therefore how you observe it. Things like color, reflectivity, physical texture, transparency. Skin, for example, is slightly transparent and absorbs the light that hits it. You don't realize it, but you know exactly what all these visible properties are without even having to think about it. So when they're off, you can tell. And it's not just about how CGI looks, but how it moves too. Bad CGI can oftentimes look photoreal when paused, but in motion looks wrong. There are three main ways we replicate motion in the digital world, and one is animation, where the motion is designed from scratch. Another is through simulation, which is putting some rules into a program and then letting it decide where things should fall. And finally, there is motion capture, which records the movements of an actor in order to most accurately replicate the subtle ways in which they move. Depending on the film, usually a combination of these three techniques are used. And the recent Planet of the Apes movies are actually great examples of this. Motion capture provides the core movement of the skeleton and face, something that's super challenging to create without reference. Those gray skin suits aren't just fashion statements after all. But added on top of that are simulations of muscle and hair that actually react to the motion of the performer. When added together, this looks more natural, but that's not to say that there isn't any human intervention. Animators usually have to step in to make alterations so that not only everything works together, but that it fits the vision of the director. And the results are exciting because through this, we can create digital characters that perform like real people. Now these days, CGI is usually pretty solid. We've gotten good enough at rendering and moving things to pass initial inspection. But there is one area of scrutiny where only absolute perfection is acceptable. Realistic human faces. People can scrutinize faces to an incredible degree. I mean, they are the defining feature in how we tell each other apart. So when we try to create human faces, we can experience what is called the uncanny valley. This graph plots our emotional response against the realism of a fake person. The far left signifies characters that are super obviously not real people, so there's an emotional disconnect. But as they get more realistic, we begin to connect more. 
Gollum from Lord of the Rings, for instance, is very lifelike, and we can even connect with him as a person. But his proportions are all wrong, so you're never fooled into thinking he's actually human. The familiarity just isn't fully there. It's the same reason why we enjoy animated movies like The Incredibles, but feel disturbed when watching The Polar Express. You see, something weird happens when characters begin to get this realistic. They fall into the uncanny valley, and we can have an adverse reaction. I'm willing to bet you won't describe this as cute. Meow. And there have been many examples of human CGI characters that fall into this valley. In fact, it's something that artists are still struggling with today. Even Star Wars Rogue One, which had some of the most realistic digital humans ever created, failed to be absolutely perfect. We may not be disturbed anymore, but we can still instinctually identify something is off. I mean, maybe it's the lighting, or the eyes, or the motion of the lips. Honestly, I don't know. Currently, I can only think of two examples that truly succeeded in climbing out of the Uncanny Valley. Take a look at this shot from the movie Logan. You may have figured this younger Wolverine was the result of some, you know, simple digital makeup, but nope. Hugh Jackman's face was 100% recreated and rendered. And this just blows my mind, because there are dozens more examples like this in the movie, but no one could tell. The other example is Rachel from Blade Runner 2049, and this is a character from the original movie, but is CGI in the sequel. Do you like our owl? The quest to make her unquestionably real took the effects team over a year, and the results were so convincing, I had no idea she wasn't real. Blade Runner 2049 ended up winning the Academy Award for Best Visual Effects in 2018, and at first, I was honestly a little disappointed. You see, I felt War for the Planet of the Apes deserved the Oscar, because creating a cast of lifelike characters is an incredible technical achievement. But here's the thing, great visual effects are about more than just technical achievement. It has to be about artistic expression as well, and that is something 2049 had in spades. I mean, that movie, oh, that movie had an aesthetic. Oh and Academy voters were swayed by the visual artistry. That and some voters apparently really thought that the Planet of the Apes crew were just really good at getting the apes to behave so well on camera. <sighs> Remember, we just press buttons. But for real though, movies like these push the bounds of technology and manage to do one very important thing, create the ability to tell better stories. At the end of the day, that is the most important role of great visual effects. They need to serve the story. When the effects of a movie are flashy just for the sake of being flashy, it doesn't serve any purpose other than to create a spectacle event. You know what I'm talking about, the disaster movies, the monster flicks, the Transformers films, the Justice League. <sighs> more and more movies are relying on CGI to hide a weak plot, and that's causing audiences to turn their noses up at it. They desire movies with real, practical effects. And I understand. Knowing that what you're seeing is real and tangible can be exciting. But I think what people are really craving is merely suspension of disbelief. When they notice CGI, the illusion is shattered, so they naturally just want less of that. Director Christopher Nolan agrees with this sentiment and strives to capture as much as possible in camera. He claims he only uses visual effects as a last resort, but I believe that's not really the case. Oh, I have no doubt that if he could have dropped Anne Hathaway into a wormhole or burned Aaron Eckhart's face off, he would have. No, no, he just simply knows that CGI is a tool and knows exactly how to use that tool to make you forget that you're watching a movie. That was the magic of Jurassic Park. This movie came out 26 years ago and the effects are so good they hold them today. But do they though? Do they really? Notice anything weird about this shot? All right, yes, the raptor disappears for one frame, and yes, that's actually in the movie. The effects were groundbreaking at the time, but if you really go back and look at only the CGI, I think you'll find that they really don't hold up. It just doesn't matter because they were used in such creative ways that for the first time in history, a movie made you believe that dinosaurs were real. And I think that that's something that the recent sequels failed to do, because on a technical level, Jurassic World has far superior CGI, but it's never really grounded in reality. It just feels like it was too preoccupied with whether it could use CGI. It didn't stop to think if it should. Normally though, you only ever notice CGI when it is bad. In fact, the best visual effects are never noticed to begin with. They're invisible. David Fincher is such a perfectionist when it comes to creative control that he would rather create digital blood than to leave it up to chance by splashing it around in real life. His team is just so good at it, you never notice. Did you know that his movie The Social Network has a thousand VFX shots in it? Yeah, the Facebook movie has more VFX than the 2014 Godzilla movie. Like, what? 
Turning one person into twins who interact with each other is pretty technical stuff that hundreds of artists worked very hard to make sure you wouldn't notice. But there is one final factor that can really dictate the quality of CGI, and that is time. The biggest issue with effects today isn't the talent of the artist creating them, but the time needed to do so. However, movie making is a business, and more time means more money, and release dates are incredibly important to the bottom line of a blockbuster, so films trying to meet deadlines can become rushed. And this was ultimately the problem with Black Panther. Now, it's important to note that most of the effects in this movie are actually great, but there were 2,500 of them, and even though the work was divided between 13 different VFX studios, there simply wasn't enough time to do everything properly. They were refilming the final fight scene in October, but the movie still had to come out in February, which left only a matter of weeks to do all of the effects for that entire scene from scratch. The company that took on this challenge has even won the VFX Oscars for all four of these movies, and yet the results prove that great CGI cannot be rushed. Like all forms of art, quality comes down to a function of skill and time. The greatest Renaissance artists took years to complete their paintings. And if I tried to paint something great, it wouldn't matter how much time I spent because I lack the skill. And I think you'll find that even great artists would deliver shoddy work when rushed to complete it. So in the movie industry where time is finite, artists have to strike a balance. No movie is ever finished, it just gets released. So the next time you're watching a summer blockbuster, even if the visuals fall flat, take a moment to appreciate all of the hard work that went unnoticed. Visual effects artists are artists after all. They pour their blood, sweat, and tears into these stories that capture our imaginations and sometimes even their best work may have been invisible all along. What you just saw was actually a TEDx talk that I performed at the University of Pennsylvania in March of 2019, and it was an awesome experience. But it was also one of the most challenging things I had ever done. Turns out making a TED talk is pretty hard, but we decided to film the entire process so that we could show you a behind the scenes look on what it's like to give a TED talk. So be sure to subscribe to the channel so that you can actually see that video when it drops in a couple days. And now for something that I've always wanted to say. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. I really enjoyed doing it. I hope you enjoyed it as well. But now for a word from our sponsor, Audible, because I'm going to talk about an audiobook called Skyward by Brandon Sanderson, one of my favorite authors. It's a story that basically combines Top Gun with How to Train Your Dragon, but like with spaceships. It's pretty great. I'm actually listening to this for a second time because he's got a sequel coming out in a month. And it's all on Audible. And speaking of Audible, you can get this for free, plus two Audible originals when you go to audible.com slash corridor crew, or by texting corridor crew to 500-500. Now, if you're a freak of nature and Sanderson isn't for you, that's okay, because there are Audible originals, which are exclusive audio titles from worlds as diverse as theater, journalism, and literature. And you can check all of this out by going to audible.com slash corridor crew, or by texting corridor crew to 500-500 to get your first free audiobook today, along with two Audible originals. It's great. Do it right now. Do it! Do it! Turns out writing a TED Talk is a lot harder than I originally thought it would be. I just did all this stuff last night. I, I've written 5,000 words. I think I'm gonna pretty much throw all of it away. I think I'm ready. I'm not ready. Oh God, I'm not ready.